well, I don't know how good you are. I hope you're going to be good. Uh, let's see, I somehow already have lost my PowerPoint. Oh, this is my PowerPoint. Um, so the first thing I like to ask you to do is if you are currently using mReader, could you please, uh, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. And if you are um, using mReader also, mention what school you are. And then I'll be able to get back to you in case I don't um, have time to cover everything. Although this is a, a longer presentation, so hopefully uh, we'll be able to. So I look forward to seeing your questions in the chat. Now, this is not a general introduction to M Reader for those who are just curious. Of course, you're going to find out a lot about it, but I'm focusing here on how the administrator in particular can configure uh, M Reader for their own uh, use in their own school. And this is um, for everyone. This is what a student page looks like in mReader. In fact, I have a live version of that. Let's see here. This is what a class page looks like for the teacher with all the students here. And the green means that the uh, student has achieved the goal for this uh, period. And you can see here, there are uh, three different periods that I've set up within the term uh, so that they're intermediate goals. And if I click on somebody, let's see Mary here. This is Mary's record of previous terms. And this is her uh, record for this term. And here is a blow by blow of every single uh, one that she has taken. Up here, you only get the pictures of when she passed, but you can see here, there are some that are not passed as well. Um, and these are the interim goals, we call them, for various periods during uh, the semester and how far she has reached them. And she's at level nine. And Les took a quiz, a quiz in April. Well, that's natural. This is actually a test site that I allowed people who want to try uh, mReader out use. So uh, it's not an active site. So all of the names you see are uh, false names as well. Okay, now let's go back to the PowerPoint. And so, yeah, here are the goals. And this particular screenshot doesn't have them, but they show here um, if they if you have used them. And this I've already showed you. Uh, this is slightly different. You see over here, the pink and the red, the color, the deeper the color, the longer it's been since a student has taken a quiz. So this is one function I'll be mentioning. Uh, it's not useful right at the beginning because no one has taken a quiz, but um, this, uh, can be useful if you want to quickly see who has been lazy. Of course, you can also see here who is leading and who has not. Okay, so the topic was what kind of school are you? How can you adjust it? So here are the major distinctions between various types of users of mReader. There are non-majors and there are majors. Now, naturally, Generally speaking, non-majors, you can't require as much reading for, but it depends, of course, on the school policy and the type of course. If it's an extensive reading course and they're non-majors, then of course, you're gonna to have to do a lot of extensive reading because that's the name of the course. But if it's a component of another course, like a general English communication course, then uh, probably you're going to have to require less. You might also think that the majors here are going to be more motivated and more cooperative. That's not always the case. Some students, at least at my school, they became English majors because they thought that was the easiest one to graduate because they did well in high school on it and they aren't particularly uh, keen on it. Um, and then motivated versus unmotivated, uh, that ties in with what I just said, but 
in many places in the world, students are doing studying English, not because they want to, but because it's a required subject. And that is one of the virtues of mReader is it allows you to check that the students are really doing uh, their work because many of them, if they think they can get away without doing it, uh, they won't do it. And so here you have a check. Uh, motivated students aren't a problem. If we had all motivated students, you wouldn't need uh, mReader. They would just read by themselves uh, without any <clears throat> need to track their reading. Now, another issue is how large your library is. If you have a large library, and uh, that means that the students can go to the library, pick a book at the correct level of a, of a genre that is, a bit, uh, that is interesting of them. And when they're, when they're finished, they can go back and pick another one from the same category. If you have fewer books, that means generally that they are not going to be able to get books at either the correct level or of interest to them. And this can be a bit of a problem. Um, of course, with them reader, they need to choose books which are in the system. And many uh, schools that are using them reader actually have their library or wherever they have the books, put all the ones together that uh, M reader has quizzes for. And in fact, when they buy new books, they make sure they have quizzes or they don't buy them. Um, admin and library support. If you have this, then uh, it makes it a lot easier for you to conduct your extensive reading. Uh, if you don't have any support, and that's common if you're a single teacher trying to have your students do extensive reading, then you are basically on your own and it's difficult to uh, get together a decent library. At, at my university at the beginning, we did not have uh, any administrative or library support at all. I bought the books with my own research funds or my own personal money. And I kept them outside my office on um, uh, several, two trolleys. And the students took them out from there and uh, signing their name and the title and return them there. And that sort of worked, except I was losing about 200 books a year. And the library wouldn't take them and put them in the library for a long time. Um, finally, they agreed, but it was because the head of the library retired and the new person was a bit more cooperative. Um, quizzes taken in class are quizzes taken at home. If they're taken in class, um, then there's not as much need for supervision because you can see that they're actually reading. Hopefully, if they have a book in front of them, um, they're reading the book and there isn't uh, a telephone inside the book that they're actually looking at. Um, if they're taken at home, then you do need considerable control because uh, you can't see what they're doing and it's easier to cheat when they are at home. So you need to be vigilant about that. And mReader does have a system uh, for that. The effect on their class grade. If it doesn't count for their cl uh, class grade, or if it's only a small percentage, like 10%, a lot of the students are not going to uh, bother with the extensive reading because they know they can probably pass the class without it. It has to be 20, 25% or more of their total grade. It usually is not the entire grade because along with extensive reading, you want to have other activities for them uh, to do in class like uh, presentations of their favorite books, small discussions. You might have them uh, do some sort of uh, summary or uh, class reports and so forth. And so those can be uh, part of the grade as well. But so the higher the percentage uh, that the uh, extensive reading is, the more serious they're going to be about the reading. And the more inducement there is to beat the system, which is the flip side of the coin, because uh, they know they need it. And so they're going to have to uh, find some way to pass those quizzes, which might be ask a friend to take the quiz for them. Now, if it's a single teacher, just you, that also 
makes it rather difficult. And actually in M-Reader, we discourage a single teacher from using this system. If the teacher is one in a school where there are other teachers who might see you using it and say, oh, that looks good. I'd like to use it in my class. Uh, that, that is fine. Uh, but if it's a single teacher, it's always going to be that way. Actually, to keep M-Reader going and to answer the questions of each school, to, uh, because it isn't that easy to set it up properly. It takes time, basically my time. And so we want to see it being used with a lot of students at each school. Now, if all classes of the same type are using it, which I mean, say, all uh, first year uh, English communication classes, for example, and it's part of the curriculum, then uh, there are other factors you have to consider, which we'll get into. And are the requirements across all classes uniform? Now, actually, some of the basic uh, settings in M-Reader have to be uniform for everyone who is using the system. If you have two different faculties in your school that are using it and they have some basic uh, differences in requirements, then you actually need two websites uh, to do it. If it's a free for all, every teacher um, does it the way they want, it is actually much more difficult to manage uh, a system like uh, M-Reader. And are you able to give them student training? And what I mean is how to read extensively, extensively in a good way. Um, can you take them to the library and show them the books and explain the different kinds of books? Um, can all of the teachers do uh, in-class activities with the books or are some just going to uh, tell the students, okay, you got to read this much by the end of the term, go to it. I'm not going to mention it in class anymore. And that's the end of it. In which case the students are not going to be very motivated and they might get the required number of uh, words read, but it's definitely not the ideal way to do it. So this is the uh, main page and I'm not sure what that is there right in the middle of it. Oh, hold on a second, let me get rid of that. Uh, that accidentally got pasted in when it shouldn't have been. Okay, and now we can go back. Yeah, that looks much prettier. So when you start using mReader, this here has to be filled in immediately. The where your school is, the country, and I tell you the prefix because if you use your student's name, John Smith, there could be a John Smith in many schools. So you can't just use a student's name. It's better to use student numbers. In fact, that's what we insist on you doing. Um, and so then the, this prefix TR2 is prefix, prefix to the number. If you go over here to the, oops, I'm not in the website. Hold on. Uh, dangers of flipping back and forth. All right, so here, let's see, I want to go here and here. And now you can see here are the teachers and they all say TR2 because that's a prefix. And here are the students and, uh, and here, are their uh, student numbers. Now, if you notice this, uh, this is an experimental site. So uh, it's not, they aren't all uniform, but here it says their number is G uh, and then six digits. Now, if you go back to the main page here, you can see here, student manual registration must conform to this format. D uh, nine is a number, A is alpha. So this, matches those student numbers that you saw. And this allows you, if you're not able to upload everybody yourself, it allows you to have uh, the students do it manually on the front page and it forces them to put it in 
the correct format. Of course, we can't check that they put in their own student number because it would still match uh, this uh, uh, format, but it makes it a lot easier if you are um, using a manual registration, which we discourage. But anyway, sometimes you have to because you can't get uh, copies of the student list from the teachers or the school administration. Uh, in Japan, and the same in China and Korea, where you have two byte characters, they often will put a two byte uh, character in instead of the single byte character. And so that becomes something different according to the computer. And here is the current status. Um, so right now students can look at their pages, they can take quizzes on their pages now, and the quiz level restriction feature is on. And this is something which you can, I recommend you use, but you need to make sure that you have enough books at each level so they can read books at their own level. If you have only a few books, then they have to choose things which are too high for them, which is not good and probably they can't read them extensively. But uh, anyway, this is very good. And if you have the quiz level restriction feature on, then over here, it says automatic promotion after eight uh, past quizzes at current level. So if you have this on, then the students can be promoted from class to class. And here you can see. So right now at this student's current level, she has only uh, passed one quiz at her current level and none, she's allowed to take six quizzes at the next level. But to get her to pr be promoted to the next level, these here have to all become full and then she'll be promoted to the next level. And this also is a motivating factor. Of course, the cover here is a motivating factor as well, but um, this, progress here, as well as the progress bar here, can motivate students to try to read more and more. Okay, so that's this. And then as you saw, there, were, there was a second column of squares, allowed quizzes above current level six. Um, I don't allow two levels above. Um, that's possible, but probably, if you have sufficient books at their current level, you don't have to do this. Um, or perhaps you need to uh, turn the quiz level restriction feature off. Interim goal feature is on. And I showed you the interim goal in the slide here, but let me just show it to you again. If I go here, you can see the goals here. But if I go here and do this and now go back here. And I think I have to refresh it. Oh my God, the interim goals have disappeared. Okay, so that's uh, the purpose or that's how that works. So I want to turn the interim goal on again. So I have to save this. And then if you have registered the email addresses for your students, then they can retrieve their passwords by email and they could also change their passwords um, while they're looking at the screen. If you click up here on your name, you will get little boxes for uh, changing your uh, email or uh, changing your password as well as your email, I believe. Okay. And I usually don't force them to change the password on the first login. In fact, many schools give the same password to everyone or something which is very predictable, like their student number with maybe an exclamation. An exclamation. Um, so that's this here. Uh, students with no recent access, I showed you that. It turns them red in the left-hand column. And this one here, all students could take a quiz now. This is uh, the time delay factor. And I have a separate PowerPoint. I wonder if it's next. Uh, I'm going the wrong way here. No, I don't see it here. Okay. Um, 
back to to here. Um, somebody has their microphone on. I, I, I hope that uh, the host can turn that off. Sounds like um, Rob Waring's car. Um, all right. So now, where was I? Uh, we were talking, oh, we were talking about the interim feature. And no, that's not what, oh, we were talking about the time delay. Okay. There are two ways to do the time delay and you can do both of them. Uh, one of them is here in the miscellaneous settings. And you can see here a uniform time delay for all students, three hours. If you have this set, that means that if a student takes a quiz, whether they pass or fail, they have to wait three hours to take the next quiz. That's reasonable, but there are other ways to do it. Like, and you can have uh, different configurations for different classes. Um, like here, the B configuration says, from the beginning, level zero, we have 10 levels starting from zero and going to nine, until level two, three hours between quizzes. And then, uh, the next two levels, two, or let's see, that was to level two. So three and four, six hours. And then until level six, which means levels five and six, 24 hours. And above that, 48 hours. So if this is a configuration, then uh, the students have to wait a very, um, a varied amount of time, depending on how long it's been since they took the previous quiz. And you can see that um, here, it says you can take a quiz now. But if you took a quiz recently, it'll say something you, like, you can take a quiz on a, a level three book in 55 minutes. You can take a quiz on a level four book in three hours and 55 minutes and so forth. And it'll tell you how long you have to wait. So, that is one way, and you set this by going to. <laughs> you set that by going to the class here, and so Monday one is now set to. There are two teachers here set for uh, Monday one. You can change the time delay just by clicking here, and then making it a B. And now uh, the B time delay uh, scheme is in effect. Okay. Oh, Sepida, uh, Sepida, you're you're here. She's watching right now. Uh, okay. And back to the main screen again. So those are the two ways to have a time delay. Why do you want a time delay? Well, the whole issue is that students tend to postpone the reading until the very end of the term. And if you have a time delay, of course, they can't do it all at the end of the term because they got to wait three hours or six hours or whatever between books. So they have to at least read, you know, uh, plan to do it in the last week or two weeks. If you have the, um, uh, the interim goal set, then of course they have to uh, read a certain amount in each of these uh, time periods. So the idea is to try to get them to read as uniformly as possible. And both of these uh, help with that. And then the penalty. Um, I see many that don't have a penalty, but the, there is a penalty for three quizzes failed in a row. And here is a percent here for what uh, uh, a failing grade is, 60%. Some people said, uh, said it at 70%. Personally, I think 70% discourages some people who did read the book, but they didn't comprehend it sufficiently. Um, even at 60%, there will be, there's a higher chance that somebody will pass um, by chance, but it also means there's less discouragement of the poorer readers who are struggling. Now, if you go to a class here, and let's go to a student here, Mary again. Uh, here it just says passed or failed, but you as a teacher can click on it and see 
the actual number uh, percent. And if you see that somebody has just barely failed, well, this is not barely. These two uh, were clearly not read sufficiently. But you can, uh, let's just say this one, you can just uh, change this from past, uh, not past to past. And now if you uh, reload the page, now you can see that it does give the word count here, but it hasn't changed this here. Um, while I'm here, there's a retake column. And if you click on that, it allows the student to take the quiz again. However, and this is a, uh, something that many teachers do not understand, this is not to allow them to take the quiz again because they failed it. It's there because there was a technical problem and it caused them not to be able to finish the text, uh, the test. There are only, there are 20 questions and each student gets a random selection of 10. So if they take it a second time, they're going to see five, six or seven of the same questions. And so it's natural the second time that they're going to have a better chance of passing, whether or not they read the book more completely or not. And it also means that they can remember what those questions are more easily because they've seen them twice and they can help their friends tell them by telling them what some of the questions are on the test. So if they fail it, just tell them, well, that book was too difficult for you, read one at a lower level or read another one. It's, it's good for you to have read it even though you didn't pass it. But anyway, uh, just let it go. And I'm going to put this back on zero. I can just hit enter, the data was changed, and now we're back to the way it was originally. All right, and um, Wendy, how are we doing for time? Oh, she's taking a coffee break, okay. Um, so anyway, I recommend about 30% of the attempted quiz words. So if they take a blockbuster book, like one that has 40,000 words, but they think they can pass it because it's, they saw the movie. Um, if they fail it, it's really going to hurt, okay? So this helps to keep the students honest. Also, um, there was one uh, teacher who asked me, um, he says that he saw a student pass three in a row, but it didn't give them the penalty. And that is because the penalty doesn't kick in right at say 59 points. It's about 10% less than the uh, percent read. And so all three of those would have had to be 10% less than 60% uh, in order for the penalty to kick in. So that just makes it a little kinder to those who honestly uh, uh, failed because they couldn't comprehend it well enough, but penalizes those that are gamifying the system, which is what we want to avoid. All right, this is optional, but it puts something here. The, the gray in the background is, uh, is here, the header background, which I have set to this gray color here. And then the logo is here, which was a transparent one so that the background shows through. Otherwise you end up with white right around here. Um, restrict IP addresses is only useful if you are having the students only do them, say, in the uh, computer lab, because the computer lab will have a specific uh, IP address for every computer. So you set the range of IP addresses in there. And there is a question mark here, which explains how it can be done. And that means that even if they're outside of class, they can't log into the system and take a quiz. This here, student uh, level self-selection, this is only for extremely motivated uh, students and it's this adult mode here. And actually I need to permit this because this can wreak havoc if you set this because students can take all sorts of quizzes um, whenever they want and it could be a security uh, issue. So anyway, this is only for the motivated students, for teachers who know that uh, this will work for them. 
Um, I don't think I mentioned this, allow all students to take quizzes for now. The, the, um, I mentioned this when I started talking about the uh, time delay, because if a student has just taken a quiz before class, and now you have them in class and you have uh, books for them to read, they can walk up to the front of the class, borrow a book, sit down, read it, and then take a quiz. They said, teacher, I can't take a quiz because I just took one before class. So if you set this here, then everyone in the, not just the class, because it's this page, everyone in the system uh, can now take uh, a quiz during this time period. Now, if it's on a class basis though, there is also down here, uh, temporarily suspend the time interval. So a teacher for an individual class can also allow this as long as you as the administrator have permitted it. So there's something here, um, let's see, temporarily turn off time restrictions. So it's checked. So now the teacher, teachers can turn it off. Okay, so here are things that you as the administrator can allow the teacher to do or not. This is uh, an issue which uh, many people have set, select books and set levels. When you start book selection and levels disabled allows them to see everything. If you accidentally have it on here, but you haven't set uh, any books that they can access, they're not going to see anything when they look at the, uh, well, it's called check quizzes here, but usually it's called uh, see available uh, quizzes. So it should be here. This here though, allows you to disallow, for example, all books related to movies, if you find that that is a problem, or disallow all books um, that are classics with high word counts or whatever. So you can manage this. So only the books that you want them to take quizzes on uh, are available. Here, you can uh, change the language into Japanese, Spanish, or Arabic for the students, the teachers, or the administrators. And the target language, uh, of course, is English here, but we do have books in Spanish and Arabic. So if you change this, then they're only going to see when they log in, they're only going to see books in that language. So these are basically self-explanatory. There is uh, an explanation here. You'll see these question marks um, all over the place. So I've gone over the main page, the miscellaneous settings. Uh, here you can upload a PDF file with your own rules for, the, uh, for how you want it run at your school uh, or contact information or whatever. And so and you put a button here, uh, local, if, what do you want to call it? Uh, ex, this is school, it's extensive reading school. So ERS information or whatever you put here and that button appears on the student's page. Um, reports, uh, students can send a report to the administrator, you or to the teacher or whatever, depending what you do, if they have an issue with it. You can configure this uh, with whatever text you want. Uh, this part will automatically appear and so uh, you can have this, so it's sent out every here two weeks from this period to that period. You can send notices of these, um, these categories here to the teachers every so often. And you can create your own leaderboards in uh, Excel. So this will help you uh, generate them. The badge function is, um, I haven't been able to test this well because I created it just before the pandemic set in. And so I was hoping I could see what difference this made in how motivated the students were, how much difference it made between the previous year and the uh, current year in uh, how much they read for the same cohort in the same school. Uh, but anyway, that waits until the pandemic is over, hopefully soon. And here is the enrollment page. And this here also has an explanation of how to do it. And I'm 
now currently, again, the pandemic has caused a problem. I've asked the developer to redo the registration system. So it's more like X reading. Uh, thank you, Paul, where they see a confirmation screen so they can see what's going to happen when they say, okay. Uh, otherwise, very often, teachers make uh, mistakes in the Excel file or the CSV file that they upload, and then there's garbage here uh, and so forth. So in order to uh, offset that, we're going to redo this as soon as we can. And here is the admin man manual, which is actually uh, a WordPress document. And it's still under construction, uh, but it has all of this information on how to set up the basic rules and so forth for you uh, to view, refresh your memory. Now to go back to this, we've talked about that. Uh, for placement of students, very often it's not really needed because very often, the students in a particular class are all at about the same level of ability. So rather than bother with a placement test, if you start them all at a very low level, the students who are good will read the required number of books at that level in a very short period of time and get promoted to the next level and the next level until they reach the level where they just uh, can't uh, get promoted quickly any longer. And actually that's quite motivating for the students to be able to go up a level so quickly. And so that sort of obviates the need for uh, a placement test. If you do have a group that is uh, that has a wide variety of abilities, then you might want to do something, but you can only set them uh, two or three notches down from what you think their level is. And this is just a very rough guide. So if you know their TOEIC level or TOEFL level or, or whatever, then you can use this and then set them a little lower than what you think they are or what their test results say they are. And these are important. There must be a way to prevent students from taking too many quizzes on a single day, which I've mentioned. And there are two basic ways to do that. And the quiz take, uh, retakes are for technical issues only, and student grades should be based on the amount read, not on their quiz scores. And this is something which um, also I have found to be uh, an, a, a problem because we do, as you saw, uh, let's see, I better just go, uh, go this way. Uh, okay, so, oh, this isn't a good class to choose. Anyway, you get the percents here. So it would be possible for you to take these percents and there's another place actually on the teacher's page. Let me go to a better page here um, from the class report here where you can get those percentages and you can download them. But this is not a good way to assess them. If you start assessing them and how much they've read, they're going to stop reading quickly. They're going to read very carefully because they know how well they uh, pass that test is going to have an effect on their grade. So please do not grade on the percent pass. Grade on how many books, uh, how many words they have read. And than other activities in class for the rest of it, but not the percent. These quizzes are not so scientifically made, right? They're made by one teacher. We've looked very quickly to see that there's some obvious problems with it, but otherwise it goes up. And until we do an item analysis and uh, delete certain questions, which, seems, uh, which seem to uh, cause students problems, um, it is going to be a bit inaccurate. So that's another rationale for keeping the percent pass too low. My desk. Okay. Um, and now let me look at the questions here. Uh, you are saying that penalties uh, deduct word counts from their current counts. Uh, how is that shown to the students? It's shown right on their student page, as I showed you. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
I don't see uh, Joel from AG suddenly very concerned about cheating after watching Paul's presentation about cheating. Your thoughts on that? Uh, cheating, yes. Good question. Uh, we have a couple ways of dealing with that. And um, you can see it here, check for cheating. And it probably won't work very well with this site. Let me get a real site. Well, no, I'm not going to because it has real names in it, sorry. Um, but check this site only or check all sites with a TR2 uh, prefix. And let's see. Uh, well, actually I have to make this a uh, much bigger time span than that. Uh, so let me go to 2019 here. Checks, uh, check for students taking the same quiz at about the same time. Uh, I'm not going to find that actually uh, here. Check, okay, so anyway, you submit this and oh, it did have, find some. So here are two students that took the quiz within four minutes of each other. Uh, here are three minutes, this two minutes. Actually, this was me testing a quiz that had a problem with it to see if I'd fix the problem, which is why there are two of them. And then if you go like this, now um, this will show uh, on their own screen as um, pending, uh, talk to the teacher, and it, it'll be deducted from the word count. The other choice besides seeing uh, from the IP address, see this is the same IP address here, 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 uh, that's one clue. Uh, and then the other thing is uh, the timing. So those are two things you can see here to determine if the students might be cheating. And then the other one is students who have whatever number of quizzes in common. Uh, that's not going to, uh, how come I set that to, let me change that to four, submit. Uh, okay, that's not working very well. In fact, this number didn't change. Excuse okay. Excuse me, Tom. Yes? Excuse me, Tom, this is Glenn. Yes, um, Glenn. I've used that, that feature before on the, the Moodle reader, and I just have a small question now since it's been many years. We don't see very many students that meet these requirements of the same IP address or within a few minutes of each other. I'm happy to report that. But this requires that the teacher goes in and looks at it. It doesn't right. feed this to the teacher automatically. Is that correct? Um, it doesn't go to the teacher automatically. Yeah, the teacher does have to look. But basically, um, it's the administrator's job. To well, do in it my case, than, we, we are administrator. But yeah. So the um, let's see. But could it be set to go to them automatically? Um, yes, that would be a possible tweak. Yeah. Okay, just a suggestion. Um, but yeah, it, it's not there yet. And <laughs> we don't even have a developer right now available, but yeah, that's possible. Thank you. Um, this is uh, Nani from Mataloko. Do you add quizzes and new books regularly? And how regular do you? Every month? No, every week. Um, let me show you. Um, let's see. I can go, I have to pull up a new, a different browser. Um, and, okay. These are all quizzes. Oh, I'm on the wrong thing. Let me get the current one here. Okay, so these here, these top two have already been entered, but all of these here, uh, these are all waiting to be entered and they probably will be uh, uploaded tomorrow. Um, so it, our uploader um, basically works one time a week. So all of these here were entered between January and March, uh, 2021. So, as the quizzes are generated uh, and they're passed to me, they get scheduled 
to uh, be uploaded. Okay. And now I've lost my chat box. There we go. Um, let's see. I don't see any more uh, questions here. Uh, one thing that my school does, in addition to just the quizzes, is for our second year students, we do ask for a short feedback report, uh, very short. Uh, and then here it says, a student, uh, this is Glenn, ID formats change. So how can end reader allow that? We have five digit and eight digit numbers, for example, depending on how long a student joined the school. Um, you'd have to uh, set it for one and then automatic uh, and then upload the rest of the students uh, using the upload uh, function. It's either one or the other. Or if the requirements of the school are uh, very different, we give you two different sites. And so then you can stipulate it uh, differently. Thanks, Tom. I have two other questions there. You can ignore them because you've answered them in your talk. Oh, okay. You may want to skip to the bottom. Joel has one. Uh, Joel, is there a way for me to flag bag or wrong quiz questions? Uh, not directly because uh, when you see the questions, you can't, uh, <laughs> They're ephemeral, they're on the screen one at a time. Just repeat anything. If you can take a screenshot, take a screenshot, send it to me telling me what quiz it was, and then uh, we'll fix it. I, I generally respond to those uh, right away. Uh, we have problems with two types of questions, actually. The ordering, sometimes there's a technical thing and uh, it might be in the uploading thing. If we uh, edit a quiz and then resave it, sometimes the ordering doesn't get uh, saved properly. And so you end up with quizzes from a different, uh, 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 a different book. And the other problem we have is the who said questions, which I'm thinking we need to abandon completely because they are very difficult for the students. And although it was supposed to be that they're the obvious characters in the book, uh, that are used for these. Very often the teachers when they're making questions go into too esoteric detail and things that the students cannot remember and they start hunting through the book trying to find uh, the quotation. So we might just abandon the um, who said questions in the future. And if you have feedback on that, um, I'd appreciate it. 